The pioneers of expedition travel are still going strong today. With their eight National Geographic flagships and five charter ships, Lindblad Expeditions takes travelers from the Antarctic to the Arctic and everywhere in between. Welcome to Paper and Can Passports Travel. Today I am talking with my friend Lisa Bain. She is the Vice President of Agency Sales for North America for Lindblad Expeditions. Lisa, thanks for joining me today. For our, for our viewers um, who may not be familiar with Lindblad, give us your 30 second uh, history rundown of Lindblad Expeditions, please. Wow, okay, start the clock. Um, <laughs> we started way back in 1966. Actually, Lars Eric Lindblad, who founded the company, um, took the very first guest to Antarctica in 66 of any company in the world. He was really, well, today he's seen as the father of small ship mm -hmm. expedition travel. Um, the following year, he took the first guest to Galapagos. And since then, we have just grown. His son took the helm of the company over 40 years ago, created some amazing alliances. The one most people know us for is our alliance with the National Geographic Society, of course. Um, and we have continued to grow and to explore. And it's all about small, intimate ships. So when we talk about it, it's the luxury of access. Intimate size allows you to get to places that other folks just can't get to alongside a remarkable team of expedition leaders that really do share and impassion our guests about the places that we travel to. Wonderful. Lovely. Very concise. I love it. Um, now, you know, you, you touched on Antarctica and we have the Galapagos and um, viewers of my uh, Facebook page and my blog and, and friends of mine know that I worked for Lindblad. So we've got a few other destinations I want to just quickly run down. You do Alaska, you do the Columbia River, Baja, Costa Rica, Panama, the Arctic. Um, and those are just on the National Geographic flagged ships or, or labeled ships. Um, you've also got some chartered ships. You do Scotland, uh, the Mediterranean, the uh, Amazon, and the Mekong, and the Nile. Am I missing Egypt. anything? Egypt, uh, Scotland. We do yeah. the rivers and locks of Scotland on the Lord of the Glens. Okay. And I will throw in on the Limblad National Geographic fleet, we now have Belize and Guatemala. Okay. And we have a Panama and Colombia, which is brand new for this year. Okay. Um, and along with all beautiful Alaska trips, we actually introduced a great um, spirit bear trip this year so along the coast of british oh. columbia we go communities see those amazing spirit bears which are the white grizzly bears or white brown bears um which is really unique and really different and i will say one of the things that's always interesting is you know we have antarctica and then people talk about the arctic like it's this one place and the arctic that's comprises of so many cool places right it's like mm -hmm. someone will call and they say we'll go to the arctic and it's like okay, we're in the Arctic and there's always this stunned silence a little bit <laughs> because it's the Russian Far East, right? It's the Northeast um, passage over, uh, over Russia. It's Svalbard. It's, it's um, Iceland kind of ties into their Greenland, the Canadian mm -hmm. Arctic. There's so many different places and cultural components and wildlife mm -hmm. components. So yeah. it's such a huge place. Yes. Okay. That's, that's a, a very good point and fair. I did not mention, you know, the span of the Arctic. Um, I've personally done Spitsbergen twice um, and that's fantastic. You also do Faroe Islands and I, that might be a new itinerary or somewhat new. Um, and then of course with Antarctica, you can do South Shetland, South Georgia, the Falklands as well. Yes. So yeah, so we do a 24 day, which is um, the Falklands, the South Georgia and the peninsula, or you do the 14 day just to the peninsula. But on our new ship that's coming, the National Geographic Endurance, which is uh, the most super cool expedition vessel out there. Um, she is going to do this epic Antarctica that takes you all the way from Ushuaia down to the peninsula, along the peninsula, the entire west coast of Antarctica, into the Ross Sea, up against the Ross Ice Shelf, and then all the way up through those little sub-Antarctic islands to New Zealand. So that's a 36-day epic Antarctic odyssey. Oh, yeah. It's absolutely brilliant. 
Do you need, any, <laughs> do you need anyone to test it for you? <laughs> well, let's see. I might be able to do something. <laughs> um, that sounds absolutely epic. And I will uh, bring that back to, I, you know, when we first met several years ago, um, we talked uh, in, not in detail, but not briefly about my dream of doing kind of the same thing in the North, going from, you know, Scotland up through the Orkneys and the Shetlands to the Faroes, to Norway, to Spitsbergen, to Iceland, to, to Greenland. And you're yeah. doing something not quite that intricate, but you're doing something like that now as well. Yeah. So we actually have, so all of those places um, are, are comprised in shorter trips. So we have a great, this year, um, we had a great trip that went from Edinburgh to Bergen through the Orkneys and the Shetland Islands. Okay. We then had this, we have this great trip that goes from Bergen across through the Faroes to Iceland. You've got Iceland and Greenland, you've got Norway and Svalbard, you've got Svalbard. And so all of these lovely little itineraries that connect and, and do some great parts of the Arctic. Mm -hmm. But then the epic Arctic trip that we're doing is actually the Northeast Passage, not the Northwest, but the Northeast. Okay. So think Trump. Norway all the way over into Murmansk across the top of Russia um, the uh, mm. all the way across into those little islands before you hit the Bering Strait and then into Nome Alaska so that's you know it's whales and belugas and narwhal and seals and bird life and polar bear and it's just and all that culture and history of exploration along the top of, of Russia, um, but just such a super cool itinerary and, and one that really hasn't been explored extensively. Yeah. Okay. Wildlife for Lindblad is is huge. Um, <clears throat> you go to a, I mean, every destination you've got amazing wildlife, like you've mentioned. Um, specifically, humpback whales, especially in Alaska. You have the gray whales down in Magdalena Bay um belugas in in the arctic we saw them while we were still at the dock in long year bend people were still boarding the ship and all of a sudden there's 25 beluga off the um stern of the ship in coming you know in the in the shallow fjord um yeah. walrus uh antarctica you know you go for the penguins and the seals and and all of that um Galapagos, let's talk about that. I know that's one of your favorite places and yep. the wildlife in Galapagos is unparalleled, right? It is. So the beauty of Galapagos is this total lack of fear of wildlife. And it's hard to get that across to people who haven't been there. They kind of look at you and go, yeah, sure. You can walk up to them. Um, but it's true. I mean, you know, you, you can be one of my favorite days. We were there and we had this woman who really wanted to get a photo of a mockingbird, right? And you'll know the mockingbirds down in Galapagos. They're, they're not a terribly colorful bird, but they're, they're endemic to certain islands. Mm -hmm. And so she had this huge lens on her camera and she's got the lens up to her face waiting for a photo. And she finally put it down because we were all laughing. And she's like, there's no bird going to come near me. And she said, well, we were all laughing because we just took great photos because there was one on the end of your lens. <laughs> <laughs> like perched on the so, end of it. <laughs> the end of her lens. So, yeah. So, I mean, it is really remarkable that you can stand on a beach and seals will be just a few feet away. Now, look, mm -hmm. the most important thing always from a wildlife standpoint is that we don't interact with the wildlife. It is yes. at the wildlife's discretion if they come to us mm -hmm. um, because we, we're we their enrichment, really. They're coming to look at us and figure out who we are, but we don't want to impress anything upon them. That's, they're, they're wild. Mm -hmm. But in Galapagos, I mean, you can walk along the tracks on North Seymour Island and there are blue-footed boobies everywhere when they're nesting or you go later in the year and it's all about frigate birds with those great big red pouches. And then what a lot of people don't realise is when you get in the water, you are surrounded by marine iguanas feeding. You've got fish. You've got amazing shark species who are very well fed, so they're not interested yeah. in you. Um, but, you know, penguins, Galapagos penguins, which is such a unique experience to be in the water with penguins, um, rays and you know, it's and seals that, you know, you they'll frolic with you in the waves. Mm -hmm. You do a, a turn in the water and they'll kind of mimic you. And so, you know, even the the 
easy, the, the most beginner of snorkelers can get out there. We provide all the equipment, so it's all ready for you when you get on board. Uh, you can be in the water and be surrounded by wildlife. So if you're going to Galapagos, A, there's not a bad time of year. Every month is spectacular. It doesn't matter if it's more in the drier season or the greener season. Um, it, it, it is just a remarkable experience. And you could go back and back and back several times and every time you're going to have a remarkable experience. It's, it's just brilliant. And we do a, a seven days, so 10 days from the time you leave home till you get back. But that full seven days, you're moving at night. So while you're asleep, the ship moves. And when you wake up, you're somewhere new and you're mm -hmm. out exploring. And the island is different because they're volcanic. So there's red sand or white sand or black ribbon lava. And some are mountainous, some are hilly, some are flat, some are desert, like some are lush. So it really, it lends itself to being able to move and really explore every island. Yeah. You touched uh, briefly on, on beginner and I want to take that and run with it. Um, Lindblad's great for families. What, um, and, and I know specifically Alaska, Galapagos, Alaska, you have the junior ranger program with the national parks. Um, when you're talking to, a, uh, say, an advisor and they have a, a client family interested, what age are we talking um, starting out on, you know, for an expedition? Is, I've, yeah, I've, that's, I've seen children, that I've, seen, I've seen babies on board, but I think that was because the trip had been planned and then someone had a baby. Um, but, yeah. you know, when I worked, we had kids as young as five in Alaska. Talk to me about family travel real quick. So yeah, so in the last few years, we've actually set up a new program in conjunction with National Geographic Education, and it is called our National Geographic Global Explorers Program. So the Global Explorers Program is aimed at children um, up to 18 years of age, uh, and that is an enrichment program. So it is not a childcare program. You don't drop your kids off. That's not a family experience. When kids are over here and parents are here, that's two separate vacations right for us we want a family to explore together and understand but we want to arm our younger guests with the ability to really learn and and be enriched by what they're seeing and so they get this super cool and i just happen to have one here they have this really <laughs> super cool how, how good of me to have this um so it's a field <laughs> notebook so prepared. And, <laughs> they're prepared and it's oh, going to cool. show up well but all this really cool information. It has spotting of different animals they're going to see, what to look for when they're out in the wild, scientific experiments they're going to do with our global explorers, educators, um, places for them to journal, to do illustrations. So it really is a way for them to then, after they've been briefed, go out with their family and help their family even see more and delve deeper into the destination. Okay. And then come Together with the younger travelers on board and discuss it they get the chance to present they get the opportunity to get a driver's license on a zodiac which i'm sure you remember it's a very interesting to see a seven-year-old driving a zodiac um but, but it is a great way for them to truly understand and that's on every alaska every galapagos and every baja departure okay. you have this amazing national geographic global explorers program now when it comes to ages i agree you know it, it does change with the family. I know you've got traveled with their children since they were infants. Those kids are already global, right? Mm -hmm. And then you've got a family who may be with their kids six or seven. They've never been anywhere except on a road trip in the States. Mm -hmm. Different level of experience. So you always want to talk to the family, understand what they want to get out of it. But five is a brilliant age. A lot of parents underestimate how much their mm -hmm. kids are going to take on and yeah. out of the experience. Yeah. And they... They just soak it in at that age. They're just such a big sponge and they love it. Um, and then we all know once they get into their, their teens, 13, 14, 15, you know, you've got to combat the phone and it takes us about 24 hours mm. to break them and them totally immersed in the destination. So don't underestimate that they can go young. But um, I would say Galapagos, Alaska, Baja, Costa Rica, you know, five and up is a great age. Mm -hmm. um, the poles, Antarctica, Arctic, seven or eight, just a little bit more maturity is really good for that. Look, we do have, we do have the ability to have younger on board, but parents just need to know that those children are in their care, that we don't mm. offer childcare. Right. Yeah. yeah, no, and especially Alaska being over the summer, um, there yeah. were always 
families. Um, I mean, I can remember trips when, as, so the Seabird and Sea Lion, the two smallest ships, um, a maximum of 63 guests. And we'd have voyages where 30 of those guests were under the age of 15. Um, yeah. It makes for a very interesting dynamic on board. Um, but, you know, the staff, the, the naturalists, always so good with the kids. There were always ones that would really take on the children. Um, Glacier Bay Day, you'd have a natural, a, a ranger on board, um, sometimes more than one. Yeah. So you'd have one that was a little more focused on the kids. Um, yeah. But that uh, notebook that you showed, is that something that comes in their pre-trip packet? Uh, or is that something they would get on board? So they get it when they get on board. It's on the end of their bed. And then they'll have their first meeting with our Global Explorers educator who'll take them through it and tell them all the things that they've got the opportunity to take advantage of. And the beauty of that now is now that it's a more formal program, um, it really does help keep those younger guests really engaged. And I think one of the cool things about the people that travel with us they tend to have more engaged children, right? They're, they're mm -hmm. the kind of kids who want to get out and learn and they want to ask mm -hmm. questions and they want to be a part of the experience. Um, we now have, along with the Seabird and the Sea Lion, you have the National Geographic Adventure and Quest, which are brand new in from 18 and 17. And those are 100 guests, a little bit bigger, but they have connecting rooms for families, which is awesome. Mm -hmm. um, and 22 company suites. So it just gives you gives you options from our mm. more active to those wild itineraries which are shorter a week um, and those are great for teenagers and active mums and dads and active multi-gen and then you've got the more traditional longer trip which is eight days and that that is great for you know maybe a little younger and a little older but in the scope because mm. you know the hikes aren't quite as long and it's not quite as active but we always get that question from the couples who are like well i I don't really want to be with kids on my trip to Alaska. So that's easy. You go earlier in May mm. or later in August, the school holidays are done and those kids are getting back into the, the busy work of being at school. And then we find that dynamic skews for more couples and, and solos. So yeah, mm. we can help with that. We can tell you <laughs> kids are on each of them. Yeah, and then um, Christmas holidays will be big for your Antarctic and and you know some of the trips around that time of year um, and spring break I know that when we were in working you know Baja Costa Rica Panama uh, the two to three weeks around Christmas were always pretty kid heavy and family heavy yep. um, so that's yep. another obviously the seasons yep. down there start around Thanksgiving yeah, so spring break is an interesting one because it to, you know, you have two or three weeks, so it's kind of amortized out over a longer period, so you don't get as heavy, um, and you'll so you'll see a more little gradual build, and then it'll kind of bobble along with more multi gen families, but on every destination, Galapagos included, we can see in our system, we can go in and say, look, with this this particular date, there are a lot of families, a lot more children on board. And so if you have clients, like I know you do, who are solos or couples who kind of are like, you know, I brought my kids up, I love seeing them, but I really don't want to be with a lot of kids. <laughs> we can help them to dates that are going to work better for them, right? So, um, you know, Antarctica, we see a lot more families um, wanting to share Antarctica with their children to kind of tell that sustainability story, mm -hmm. to let them understand the impacts that we can have from here in the US, wherever we are, the impacts we can have on places as far away as Antarctica. So that's a, it's an amazing story for families to share with their children, for sure. Yeah, well, it's, you know, a destination that's on a lot of bucket lists. It's on mine. It's on my mother's. I'm sure there'll be a a multi-gen trip coming up soon for Antarctica, hopefully, fingers crossed. Hint, hint, mom, dad. <laughs> um, so I want to shift gears slightly. And um, you, you know, talking about people on board, the ships are small. They're not floating hotels. Um, but my dad actually said this after our trip to Svalbard. He never felt crowded. And I don't think our, our trip was entirely sold out, but it was 
late June, early July, it was peak season for the Arctic for Svalbard. And sure, you know, sometimes the bow would be crowded. The bridge was usually crowded. Um, but the only time you ever saw anyone was in the dining room. And even then with having the little bistro and then at lunchtime having the um, observatory library open for lunch, you don't see all, everybody on your trip all the time, every day, um, which is great. And we're going to, again, slightly turn this into something else. One of the things that you and Don Martinson and Ashish and Paul Largay spoke about was the future of travel after COVID and, and when we're back traveling. And one of the things that a lot of people are talking about is smaller groups, private travel, um, remote destinations. Lindblad's perfect for that. The ships are perfect for that. So what do you have to say? <laughs> yeah, no, that's a, and that's a really good question. I think, you know, none of us have a crystal ball to see what's coming down the line, mm -hmm. right? We're all taking this day by day. But certainly I would say that from our very beginning, we've all been, Lindblad has been about social distancing. We get <laughs> as far away from other people as possibly can because we yeah. want to get you out where the wildlife is right mm -hmm. and I, I think that's great how you brought up the ships and how you never feel on on our ships that you are cramped or caught mm -hmm. with lots of folks always these amazing little nooks and crannies to get away and find private space private time and these are on ships that you know our biggest ship is 148 guests mm -hmm. our smallest is 28 guests these are not huge ships and there's a reason for that because that intimacy of scale allows you to get into the places that we want to go so if you think of it this way you start to build ships that have you know really big staterooms thousand square feet oh lovely and comfy but now what happens to ship ship gets bigger big big ship can't get to the places we go mm -hmm. so it's a very delicate balance between number of people and the size of the ship to allow for that feeling of space mm -hmm. and and to get away and be your own and also the ability to come together as a community which what expedition is all about right it's about being a community traveling and often your fellow guests are just as interesting as the places we go yeah. um one of the really cool things that we i mean sustainability has been the heart and soul of what we've done from the very very beginning sustainability and one of the things it does it does <laughs> I put that on my t-shirt if i turn around later um, um you know one of the things that we were working on last year before this whole COVID-19 kind of raised its ugly head was, you know, from a sustainability standpoint, we were looking at how do we lower the amount of water we're using on our ships and the amount of plastic bottles and how do we make our ships a safer environment? And we introduced um, our ships and they're all now self-disinfecting, which perfect timing, I guess. Yeah. But we now have a system where we spray all of our ships with this photocatalytic system, which then kills viruses on contact, continues to work. Um, and so it, it does three things, it makes ships a safer place to be, makes us use less water and, and less resources, and we don't put as much waste into the world in the form of plastic bottles. Mm -hmm. But I guess going forward, that's a, that's a great thing to know. It gives you a bit more comfort when you're on ships. You're certainly not going to places where you're going to be disgorged, where there's 13,000 people getting off at a dock, because we have those docks like dare I say it like the plague um, you know we we want to take you to the remote and then when you're out during the day you're in small groups on a zodiac you know 10 maybe 12 people getting in a zodiac so it's all about having space it's all about having that ability to be away and to experience at your own level and I think you know as Paul did the other night we kind of talked about the I think people have been locked up for so long right now with this, that that feeling of being out in wildness, being close to what we've taken for granted mm -hmm. for so long, right? Yeah. And knowing it's out there waiting for us has taken on a new meaning. And I really do think that people are, just can't wait to get back out into it, but be out there on their own, not with, you know, mm -hmm. a thousand, three thousand. Yeah. Um, I, I want to wrap up. We've talked now for about 30 minutes. Um, we, t one of the things that, you know, we've, as an industry have sort of, I don't want to say come to the conclusion, but discussed is that domestic travel is going to open up first. So for those of us 
here in the US. Um, you know, national parks, staycations in your nearby home city. Um, you're a ship product though. So what are some domestic US trips that potentially short, you know, four or five days? Um, what are some, some trips that American travelers could take, stay domestically, but still support, a, you know, a family owned small local businesses yeah. in local communities with Lindblad? So of course, Alaska, that's a biggie for us. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, we have so many different options and you've got from the shorter trips, the wild trips to the longer trips. So certainly Alaska, the coast of British Columbia coming down. Mm -hmm. Columbia Snake River, that's a great itinerary. Yeah. I mean, fall and a spring, you know, spring is all about the, the, the farms being planted, the vineyards starting to, you know, pop with color and, mm -hmm. um, then you've got the fall, which is all about the harvest and amazing yeah. cheeses and wine, and local beverages. And a lot of people don't realize that the Columbia Snake River trip rises up through a lock system that is much higher than going through the Panama Canal. So there's all this yes. really cool history in the way, uh, or the, the march to the West Coast, all of that is, is right in there. So once again, that's a great family experience as well. Mm -hmm. um, come down the coast and we head from California, those wonderful little islands off the coast there, down all the way to Baja. And although not America, um, <laughs> you know, it's still close to home to get onto the Baja <laughs> Peninsula, you know, the Sea of Cortez, Magdalena yeah. Bay with those gray whales. Um, and we do, we have a trip over the Christmas or the holiday festive season, which is just a wellness trip down there. So it is just yoga on the beach, hiking, you know, okay. sitting under the stars with a bonfire at night, just a great way to recharge and, and come back to, to nature just, you know, by sitting still. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a great trip down in uh, the Sea of Cortez. So those would be the first ones, I think, because of their proximity. Um, and then, you know, you would start to look at things like Galapagos, which is not too far a trip to make, or Costa Rica, Panama. Mm -hmm. um, but it's been really interesting. Um, the, the focus on folks really wanting to reach out for Antarctica. I think they see that yeah. as a, as a okay. safe place, right? Mm -hmm. There's not a lot of, a lot of, a lot of COVID-19 down there, but, um, yeah. you know, they see that as they've been wanting to go there forever. And like, you know, damn the torpedoes. We're just going to do it. We're going to get down. We want it now. Um, and it is, it's a remarkable place. So, Yeah. Well, then I think that's a, a great place to end. Um, one of the things I always tell people is, you know, life can change quickly. We have seen that now with, you know, being able to go to the gym one day and turning around and trying to leave your house the next, you're not allowed to. Um, so if you want to take that trip, if Antarctica has been on your bucket list for 10 years, like it has mine, um, now's a great time to plan it. And Lindblad's a great company to go with. So Lisa, thank you very much for talking with me about adventure travel and Pleasure expeditions and, and all of that fun stuff and hope to see you soon in person. <laughs> yeah, trust me, me too. <laughs>